Number 10, Bleach Injection. A nurse managed to kill five of her patients by injecting bleach straight into their dialysis tubes. Her name is Kimberly Science, and she worked at the DaVita Dialysis Center in Lufkin, Texas. Investigators at the time of the murders were trying to figure out why there were so many fatal heart attacks happening, far more than usual. As it turned out, Kimberly was behind it. Kimberly herself was born in 1973 in Massachusetts. She eventually moved to the small town of Lufkin, and then in 2007, started working as a vocational nurse at the center. Before this, she was fired from a handful of other healthcare jobs. She was fired from the Lufkin Hospital after being accused of stealing drugs and faking her urine test. Around the time she started working at the center, her marriage was in a rough patch. Her husband had already filed for divorce and even obtained a restraining order against her. In 2007, she was also arrested for public intoxication, domestic disturbance, and criminal trespassing. By 2008, she was heavily medicating herself for depression. It was around the same time that Kimberly started feeding herself medication that people at the center started dying. They saw a spike in patients suffering from cardiac arrest during dialysis treatment. Medical responders were called to the facility no less than 30 times in a single month, whereas in 15 months prior, they had only been called twice. Clearly, someone was murdering these people. Kimberly was quickly busted. Patients actually witnessed her preparing a bleach solution and then putting it inside a syringe. She was fired from the job, quickly arrested by local police, and charged with one count of capital murder and five counts of aggregated assault. Number 9. Italy's Angel of Death Daniela Poggiali is known as Italy's Angel of Death. She is also considered to be the worst serial killer nurse in history. The authorities suspected that Daniela had killed upwards of 90 people while working as a nurse. Investigators originally accused her of drip-feeding as many as 38 patients pure potassium chloride, which happens to be the same chemical compound that they use in the United States for lethal injections. That original 38 has since risen to 93, and all over the course of just two years. While the investigators still don't know all the grisly details of these terrible murders, they fear she could have been killing up to three people a day. You're probably wondering how all of this even happened. How does someone kill 90 people without getting busted? According to the police, she wasn't really a prime suspect. She had no mental illness. She wasn't a visible psychopath, and she had no criminal priors. It's believed that the murders were part of a power trip, as Daniela had a god complex and got off on easily murdering people. Naturally, Daniela denied the accusations, but it didn't save her from being sentenced to spend 30 years in prison in 2016. She will likely never see daylight again for her terrible crimes. Number 8. Charles Cullen Charles Cullen is the most notorious serial killer in the history of New Jersey. Back in December of 2003, he told authorities that he had murdered up to 45 patients during the 16 years he had worked at various hospitals throughout New Jersey and Pennsylvania. The first murder was committed on June 11, 1988. A judge had been admitted to the St. Barnabas Medical Center for an allergic reaction. Instead of treating the man, Charles injected him with a lethal overdose of medication. He went on to kill 10 more people at that hospital, including a patient suffering from AIDS, who Charles injected with way too much insulin. He quit his job in 1992 when authorities at the hospital began getting suspicious, but his killing was far from over. He went on to get a job at the Warren Hospital in Phillipsburg. He murdered three old ladies by forcing them to overdose on their medications. His final victim even claimed that a male nurse had injected her with something while she was asleep, but the healthcare workers at the facility dismissed her comments and called her crazy. This went on and on until 2003, when after murdering people at 10 different hospitals, he was finally apprehended by the police. On March 2, 2006, the insane nurse was given 11 consecutive life sentences. He will be eligible for parole in 397 years. Number 7 stealing identities. A nursing assistant had gotten into some serious trouble for stealing the identities of people she was supposed to be taking care of. 24-year-old Sierra Johnson got busted stealing a woman's wallet at a care facility, then using the information to commit fraud. To make this even worse, the victim is a veteran of World War II, approximately 100 years old at the time of the crime. She had been in Europe working to process mail sent to the troops. In 2020, she had her wallet stolen from the nursing assistant, and that was when her trouble started. Sierra Johnson used the veteran's identity to lease an apartment and purchase a Chrysler 300. She managed to get away with it by using an app with an age filter to make herself look older. 
thus securing the license for the application on the apartment and the vehicle with a fake selfie. And this was only one of Sierra's victims. Investigators say she stole at least seven different identities while working at different care facilities in Phoenix, Mesa, and Goodyear. The police found stolen cards in her apartment, which ultimately did her in. She's since been arrested, but we don't know exactly how long she'll spend in jail. She's been charged with identity theft, fraud, and forgery. What do you think the punishment should be for a nurse stealing a war veteran's identity? Let us know in the comments, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe button if you haven't already. Number 6. Tennessee Pill Mill Three nurse practitioners in Tennessee were recently arrested and ended up in federal court for prescribing huge quantities of opioids as part of a pill mill. The nurses are Cynthia Clemens, Courtney Newman, and Holly Carmichael Womack. They were at the head of a multi-state pill mill operation that has so far resulted in over 140 convictions. But just what exactly is a pill mill, and how did these women pull it off? By using their status as nurses, they were able to prescribe millions and millions of tablets of drugs worth a whole lot of money on the street. These drugs included oxymorphone, oxycodone, and plain old morphine. They operated out of four different clinics in Tennessee, prescribing the drugs to people already addicted to opioids. Of course, they did this for profit, generating roughly $21 million in revenue. But that was just their revenue, as the street value of the drugs is over $360 million. There were actually more people involved than just the three nurses. One of the people arrested was Sylvia Hofstetter, whom prosecutors describe as the largest drug dealer to ever appear in a Tennessee federal courtroom. Men were even extradited from Italy for their roles in the lucrative pill mill scheme. Number 5. Jane Toppin Jane Toppin was born on March 31, 1854. She was arrested 47 years later in 1901 for a slew of terrifying murders. She was actually quoted as telling the authorities that she wanted to accomplish killing more helpless people than anyone else who ever lived. At the time, she confessed to approximately 31 killings, though only 12 of those were ever confirmed. So, who exactly did this crazy lady end up murdering? The murder victims were her patients, and even the family members of her patients. She did the killings while working as a nurse from between 1885 and the time of her arrest. She worked at the Cambridge Hospital, where her co-workers called her Jolly Jane. She was extremely well-liked, her patients never complained, and she was an all-around respected lady. But what nobody knew was that Jane was using her patients as unwilling guinea pigs, performing experiments on them with morphine. She would change how much drug she gave a person, to see how their nervous system reacted. It was a warm-up for the bloodbath to come. In 1889, Jane was recommended for a position at the Massachusetts General Hospital. However, she ended up getting fired for recklessly administering opiates. Several of the murders had even taken place there. She opened her own clinic as a private nurse and in 1895 began killing indiscriminately. She murdered her landlord, her foster sister, and a whole heap of elderly people, all by using lethal injection. She had learned how to kill people with injections during these early years at Cambridge Hospital. But Jane got too bold. By killing so many people close to her, the authorities eventually figured out what was happening and took her in. She was charged with the murders, declared insane, and committed for the rest of her life inside the Taunton Insane Hospital. Number 4. The Baby Thief A woman pretending to be a nurse walked into a hospital by herself and strolled out minutes later with a baby. This insane act of fraud and human thievery happened in India, in the city of Pune. The woman was identified as 24-year-old Vandana Jeth. The victim was the baby of an unnamed 22-year-old woman who had just gone to the Sassoon General Hospital for treatment. The mother and her baby were sitting in the care ward waiting to see the doctor when a woman wearing a nurse's uniform walked into the room. The nurse told the mother that one of her family members had just arrived to meet her. The nurse then offered to look after the woman's baby while she went and talked to the relative. Not even thinking twice, the mother handed over the infant and walked out of the room. When she returned, the nurse and the baby were gone. Obviously panicked, the woman informed security at the hospital, who contacted the local police station. The police launched an immediate search for the baby, and one of the first things they did was check the hospital surveillance footage. That's when they saw Vandana, dressed in the nurse's uniform, walking out of the front doors with the stolen child. They quickly tracked her down, arrested the fake nurse, and reunited the baby with her mother. But what makes this story really crazy is that no motive has been given yet for why Vandana pretended to be a nurse just to steal a person's baby. The best that the police can put together is that she's unable to have her own. 
so she thought she'd just stroll into the hospital and get one. Number 3. Fentanyl Thief In Connecticut, a nurse got into serious trouble for stealing fentanyl from patients who were undergoing surgeries. She would steal the drug, then substitute it with a saline solution. Her name is Donna Monacone, and she was recently given three months of home confinement, four weekends in prison, and three years of supervision. Donna was working at the Yale Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility Clinic when she developed her problem. Most of her patients she was dealing with were receiving fertility treatments. Part of the treatment involved fentanyl being delivered in an IV so that the patients didn't feel any pain during the procedure. Unfortunately for the patients, they all felt incredible pain. Donna swapped out the pain-relieving fentanyl for saline, then used the fentanyl to get herself high. She was horribly addicted to the stuff, and it all started after she and her husband got divorced. To make matters worse, the woman who got robbed of their fentanyl were treated like drug addicts by their doctors, who then complained that fentanyl wasn't working. They were going into surgeries with absolutely no pain medication, then being ridiculed when they complained that it hurt too much. Luckily, enough women complained that the doctors eventually figured out something was wrong, and they tracked it back to Donna. She has since had her license revoked and her place firmly secured in hell. Number 2. Killer Nurse Janine Jones pled guilty to the death of Joshua Earl Sawyer, an 11-month-old baby who died in December of 1981. She pled guilty on the condition that the other four charges of baby killing were dropped. These horrific murders go back to the 1970s, when Janine Jones worked as a nurse in Texas. And before we go any further, it's important to understand that she didn't just kill five babies. She's been accused of causing the deaths of up to 60 infants and young kids while working as a vocational nurse over almost two decades. She was finally caught in 1984 for injecting babies with certain chemicals to kill them. It was 15-month-old Chalisa McClellan that she was caught murdering, gaining her a prison sentence of 99 years. The most recent conviction of Joshua Sawyer came in 2017 to prevent Janine from being released due to a Texas law designed to prevent prison overcrowding. She was supposed to be released mandatorily in 2018, but the newest murder charge put her away for the rest of her life. As for why she did it, she claimed that it was all to stimulate a special pediatric intensive care unit in the city of Kerrville where she worked. She thought that if enough babies died, they'd have to create a new intensive care unit for kids. In her twisted mind, she actually thought she was doing the right thing. And number one, the OnlyFans nurse. Allie Ray was a hardworking nurse whose situation changed dramatically in September of 2020. She had been working brutal 14-hour days in the intensive care unit for barely any money until the COVID-19 pandemic happened. With the lockdown, things changed. She found herself selling risque pictures of herself online to help pay the bills. What she hadn't expected when she started posting the pictures was that she'd make a fortune. In the first month, she made almost double what she was making as a nurse, and she got good at selling herself. She ended up making $75,000 a month with OnlyFans. But it wasn't long until jealous colleagues uncovered what she was doing. When her co-workers came across her profile, they sent it along to her boss. Her boss then gave her an ultimatum. She could either quit posting lewd pictures of herself on the internet and keep her job, or she was fired. Allie chose to be fired, and she's now 37 years old and making almost $100,000 a month, and she doesn't have to step foot inside a hospital. Number 10. Fateful Flight to Las Vegas A private plane filled with Instagram stars crashed while flying to Las Vegas. All six people on board perished. For those who absolutely despise Instagram celebrities, this is probably the ultimate irony. People who got famous for taking pictures, living the luxury lifestyle, literally died because of their luxury lifestyle. Their private plane crashed in Arizona, plummeting into TPC Scottsdale 15 minutes after taking off from the airport. By 9 o'clock in the evening, the wreckage was on fire. The victims are Mariah Sunshine Coogan, Iris Rodriguez Garcia, Alina Lagos, James Pedroza, Anand Patel, and Eric Valente. James Pedroza was the one piloting the aircraft. The last check that Pedroza did with air traffic control, he did not indicate that there was any trouble on board. When the air traffic controller asked if he was experiencing any difficulty, he said that everything was good. They were just doing a training session. Immediately after, the plane crashed. The Federal Aviation Administration is investigating the incident, though they have not been able to determine why the plane went down. The plane was a Piper PA-24 Comanche, 
popular with private flyers. As for the Instagram celebrities themselves, Mariah Sunshine Coogan was arguably the most famous. She had over 28,000 followers and was only 23 years old. She actually quit high school back in 2012 to pursue a career in the modeling industry. A career in the modeling industry translated to taking pictures of herself at pools with her friends. Number 9. Coachella Valley Disaster Four residents of Coachella Valley were killed when a private jet crashed down near Lake Tahoe on a Monday afternoon. The private jet was a Bombardier CL-600. It crashed near a golf course in the town of Truckee, killing six people on board the plane. According to the Federal Aviation Administration, the aircraft went down just a few blocks from the runway as the pilot was trying to land. What we do know is that four of the six deceased had direct ties to the Coachella Valley, with at least three of them being part of the Hideaway Golf Club. What that means is that they were filthy stinking rich, as the golf club happens to be private in an area where homes sell for around six million apiece. We don't yet know who all the victims are or why they were flying into the area. We also don't know why the plane crashed. It touched down in a wooded area just beside the golf course, leaving behind blackened trees, chunks of twisted metal, and of course, mutilated bodies. Number eight, split in half. A private jet had the worst landing ever in the capital of Honduras, Tegucigalpa. The Gulfstream G200 was a private jet that took off from Austin, Texas, and then skidded off the runway when it tried to touch down in Honduras at the international airport. Rather than just sliding and coming to a stop, it went across the street into a forested area and split in half. Miraculously, the six Americans on board were rescued with only minor injuries, even though the plane crumpled as if it was made of paper. All six of them, five men and one woman, walked away practically unharmed. It was unclear why the plane crashed the way it did, though aviation expert Andrew Charlton did have some theories. He told reporters with the BBC News that the Gulfstream G200 is a back-heavy vehicle. When this kind of airplane lands at speeds of 200 miles per hour, it is under extreme pressure. Something obviously went wrong with the landing, and all that pressure caused the airplane to split in two. The only reason everyone survived was that they had been sitting closer to the front, and also because they had been wearing seatbelts. If it hadn't been for their seatbelts, they would have been throttled forward through the cabin and potentially killed. Number 7. Stranded in the Jungle Antonio Cena went missing on January 28, 2021. He was flying a private jet on his way to a gold mine in the rural Brazilian state of Para when he encountered engine problems. He was the only person in the plane, and for good reason. His assignment involved an illegal mining operation deep in the Brazilian jungle. It was a very valuable opportunity for him that would earn him quite a bit of cash. But when the engine failed, Antonio had no choice but to crash through the trees and into the ground. Miraculously, he survived the impact. He crawled through the shattered windshield and got away from the plane just seconds before it exploded in a great ball of fire. But now he has a serious problem. He was stranded in the jungle. For the next 36 days, Antonio struggled to survive. Luckily, he had a backpack filled with essentials for just an occasion. He had pocket knives, a torch, rope, a bit of food, some water, and even a change of clothes. And because he wasn't injured, he was able to move continuously through the jungle in search of help. As he was walking, he was powerless to signal the rescue aircraft that he could hear buzzing over the jungle canopy. He saw them, but they couldn't see him. He used the last bit of battery life on his phone to determine the exact position of the nearest river, where he thought he might find a settlement. After walking for three weeks, he managed to stumble upon some nut collectors. These men helped take Antonio to civilization, where he could finally get a helicopter out of the jungle. Do you think you'd be able to survive 36 days in the jungle? Let us know how hardy you think you are in the comments below. And if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe button if you haven't already. Number 6. Burst into Flames A private jet crashed north of the Houston Executive Airport in October of 2021. The jet ran off the runway, smashed through a fence, and then burst into flames. According to the investigators and federal authorities, the private plane had not been flown since last December. That means it was sitting idle for 10 months. Investigators are still looking to see if any maintenance has been performed on the plane between sitting unused and taking to the runway. The National Transportation Safety Board says the plane left 1,200 feet of tire marks as it tried desperately to get off the runway. This indicates a heavy braking event. The brakes were definitely working to some degree, and the pilot was hammering down on them hard. However, nobody knows why the pilot was applying the brakes so furiously, or why the brakes were powerless to stop the McDonnell Douglas MD-87. But here's the real miracle of the plane crash. 
all of the 21 people on board the private plane managed to escape unscathed. Well, two people did suffer minor injuries, but that's not such a big deal when they could have been cooked alive by the flames that consumed the plane. Number 5. Straight into the wall In Milan, Italy, a private plane was on its way to the island of Sardinia, but rather than touching down gently on the island and everyone going about their business, the plane smashed into the side of a building and killed eight people. The plane crashed into an office building in the northern part of Milan. The only silver lining here is that the office block had been empty at the time of the crash. If anyone had been working inside of it, they undoubtedly would have been massacred by the huge bucket of bolts that slammed into it. Every single person on board had perished. The pilot of the private plane happened to be a billionaire from Romania, a guy named Dan Petrescu. Everybody is really hating on billionaires these days, but Dan's death truly was tragic. This is especially true because he was flying with his wife and their son. He may have been richer than pretty much everybody, but he was still a person with a family. The crash was so intense that it set the entire block of offices on fire and blew up several cars that were parked in front of the building. It left a trail of wreckage of almost 10 cars smoking and billowing fire. Number 4. A Failed Delivery When a small plane crashed in Southern California, two people were killed, including a UPS driver. Two other people were injured as the plane made its horrifying landing in the middle of a neighborhood. The aircraft was a twin-engine Cessna 340, and it crashed about 20 miles from San Diego in the city of Santee. It didn't crash in a field, not even on the street. The plane plummeted into a group of houses and vehicles like an asteroid falling out of space. Three homes were seriously damaged. Two of them were completely burned, and a UPS truck was decimated. A retired couple had to be rescued from their home, with the woman being pulled out of the window as her house was engulfed in flames while her husband was rescued from the backyard. Sadly, the family dog was unable to make it out. The plane took off earlier that day from Yuma in Arizona. The air traffic controller alerted the pilot that they were flying too low, and that was right before the crash. The plane was flying at 1,500 feet instead of 5,000 feet. The pilot was Dr. Sugata Das, chief medical officer at the Yuma Regional Medical Center. He frequently commuted between work in Yuma and his home in San Diego. But for some unknown reason, the commute proved to be his last. Number 3. Crashed in Tampa Bay A small plane made a messy landing in Tampa Bay near the Peter O. Knight Airport, making a big splash about 500 yards from the runway. A police boat and private seaplane had to rush into action to save the life of the pilot and the single passenger. Both managed to escape the plane without serious injuries. Though the plane wasn't nearly as lucky, the single-engine Mooney M20 sank to the bottom of the bay. According to Sandra Bennell with the local police, the plane took off from Gainesville and was on its way to Tampa when engine problems caused it to crash. It was a miracle the two people on board the plane didn't die, but the actual cause of the crash is impossible to figure out until divers recover the wreckage from the bay to investigate fully. Oddly enough, this was the third plane that made an emergency landing around Tampa Bay in just two weeks. Number 2. Too Close to the Sun Glenn DeVries was a technology entrepreneur with a lot more money than most people. If you recognize the name, it's probably because he just flew into space along with William Shatner on Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos' spaceflight company. But as they say, if you fly too close to the sun, you might get burned. After making it all the way to space, the final frontier, Glenn DeVries died in his private plane while trying to fly through New Jersey. He crashed 40 miles from Manhattan in a single-engine Cessna 172. The entrepreneur had been flying from Essex County to Sussex County when the plane crashed under unknown circumstances. The Federal Aviation Administration is still trying to figure out what went wrong. What we do know is that the entrepreneur got his private pilot license just recently in May. Commercial flight instructor Thomas P. Fisher was also on board the airplane when it crashed. He too perished. From what anyone can tell, this looks like a classic case of a training accident. And number one, the Air Force disaster of 1996. In 1996, April 3rd to be exact, Ron Brown and 34 other people were killed when their Air Force CT-43 crashed into a mountain. Ron Brown was the Secretary of Commerce at the time for the Clinton administration. This was a private government aircraft flying near Dubrovnik in Croatia. An inquiry done by the Air Force blamed the brutal crash on the pilot as well as a poorly designed landing by the Croatians. The people on the airplane included business executives and government officials. Back in the 90s, Croatia was devastated by war. They had only been recently broken away from Yugoslavia. 
The business executives and the government representatives were there to explore investment opportunities, or in other words, to exploit the war-torn nation. But when the pilot tried to land the plane on the runway, he got confused, miscalculated his approach, and smashed into the side of a mountain, killing everyone on board except for two people. Only two Americans walked away from this crash, making it one of the worst private plane disasters in history. Number 10. Violent October October 2021 was a rough month for MMA fighters beating up their girlfriends. While this is definitely nothing new to the world of fighting, it hit a serious peak in October when both Louis Pena and Chuck Liddell were arrested for domestic battery within just days of one another. The first case is Luis Pena, who not only beat up his girlfriend, but a second random woman too. According to the affidavit, the Broward County Sheriff's Office said that Pena intentionally hit his girlfriend in the face several times with a closed fist. When she fell over on the ground, the USO continued to do what's known in the business as a ground and pound. While on top of her, he continued to hammer her in the face. By the time she was taken to the hospital, she was suffering from abrasions on her wrist and even a bite mark on her knee from where the maniac started gnawing on her. A woman who had absolutely nothing to do with the attack saw what was happening and tried to stop it. That's when Louise turned his attention on her and gave her a swift jab to the eye. She fell over and that was it. As for Chuck Liddell, he was also arrested for beating up his partner. It happened just after midnight when deputies had to respond to a family disturbance at Chuck's house. The sheriff's office says that Chuck and his wife had been involved in a physical altercation, though his wife did not need medical treatment. But from what Chuck says, it was actually his wife who assaulted him. Number 9. Fighting in the Streets A mixed martial arts fighter got into a bare-fisted brawl with a European powerlifter on the streets of Russia. The powerlifting champion was 32-year-old Andrei Drakev. The MMA fighter was Anar Alekvarinov. The two men got into an argument over something extremely silly. They were debating whether MMA fighting is better than gymnastics. To make matters more ridiculous, it happened at 7 o'clock in the morning outside a cafe where people were eating their breakfast. Just imagine waiting in line for your first sip of coffee and then seeing these two bulky dudes start throwing punches at one another. The two men got so worked up about the topic that the MMA fighter savagely attacked the powerlifter. Bystanders even got video of the MMA fighter kicking the powerlifter until he fell to the ground, then getting on him and punching him repeatedly in the face. Apparently, powerlifting doesn't do much when you actually get into a fight with somebody who knows how to kick and punch. Even though Andre Drakev won the silver medal for powerlifting at the World Championships in 2011, he got beat up in front of a cafe and didn't even get a good punch in. But here's where things get tragic. The MMA fighter actually kicked the guy to death. He just kept kicking and kicking until the powerlifter stopped breathing. Yikes. The police then launched a manhunt to track this guy down, but he later turned himself in. After a trial that went on for over a year, he was finally found guilty of homicide and given 18 years in jail. But that still doesn't answer the question. What's better, MMA or gymnastics? Number 8. Attempted Murder UFC fighter Erwin Rivera was recently arrested for two counts of attempted murder. He was apprehended by officers with the Boynton Beach Police Department, then held in jail without the possibility of bail. The reason is that Erwin Rivera stabbed both his sisters to death. His sisters, one of them 22 and the other 33, were discovered by Boynton Beach Police after they were called to a residence where there had been an alleged disturbance. It was quite a serious disturbance, actually, since the 22-year-old had stabbed wounds to her back, head, and arm. The other sister had been stabbed repeatedly all across her body, and both her lungs had collapsed. Amazingly, both girls survived the brutal attack, with one in stable condition and the other in critical condition. Erwin later admitted to the police, after they caught up with him when he fled from the scene, that he killed his sisters and he did it on purpose. He snuck into the bedroom while they were asleep, and stabbed them mercilessly with a brass knuckle knife. Why did this complete psychopath attempt to kill his siblings? He told the authorities that he did it because a higher power told him to. Some ambivalent god told him that it was his purpose. In a really bizarre statement from the UFC that came out after his arrest, they said that the situation was extremely troubling. They also said that they would not be offering Erwin a fight at this time. 
but that seems kind of redundant to say, considering he's in jail for a double murder. Of course he won't be fighting, at least not in the octagon. Number 7. Ferverge on the Beach An MMA fighter was filmed on the beach, punching a man in the face. Normally, this would land a person in some serious trouble, but in this case, Joyce Vieira may not have done anything wrong. She and a friend were taking photographs in the bikinis on a beach in Rio de Janeiro. As they were in the middle of the swimwear photo shoot, a man also on the beach began doing something extremely inappropriate to himself. In an interview, Joyce said that when she looked at him, he had his shorts all the way down and was standing on a public path where children could easily see him. She was so angry at this creep, especially since he was staring right at her and making weird sounds and moaning, that she went up and punched him directly in the face. The MMA fighter has some serious skills, so she was easily able to beat this guy up. After the incident, the man was arrested by the police, but then immediately released because he simply denied that he ever committed any crime. He said Joyce was lying. The cops just let him go. What do you think about this terrifying case? Was Joyce in the right for punching this guy in the head? Or was she overly violent? And for that matter, do you think the police should have let this guy go or gave him a more severe punishment? Let us know your thoughts in the comments, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 6. Naked in Church Relatively famous MMA fighter Mayhem Miller trashed a church and was arrested naked. It happened in South Carolina when a 31-year-old was discovered at the Mission Hills Church in Mission Viejo, passed out on a Monday morning. When the church people came in for Sunday business as usual, they found Miller naked on the couch. They also found that the whole first floor was ransacked, as if he had been attempting to rub the place. He pulled the books off the bookshelves, smashed pictures, and even spray-painted the walls. After he went on a rampage, he got naked, fired off a fire extinguisher, and fell asleep on the couch. When the pastor found him, he ran away and called the police. For those who don't know Mayhem Miller, he's a middleweight fighter in the UFC, and he hosts the MTV series Bully Beatdown. Although he first came to fame on the old Spike TV show The Ultimate Fighter, back when people still watched cable TV. The reason he went into the California church and made a huge mess was probably because he was wasted. When the cops woke him up and asked him who he was, he kept muttering mayhem, mayhem, over and over again. The Orange County sheriffs thought he was crazy and brought him into the hospital, then booked him in jail before he was released on a $20,000 bail. He's now facing charges of suspicion of burglary and vandalism. Number 5. Exploding Biceps A fake bodybuilder in Russia nicknamed Popeye because he has ridiculously bulging biceps got beat up in an MMA fight. Popeye, real name Kirill Tereshin, injected his biceps with synthol oil to enhance the size of his muscles. Ew. He didn't actually train to get strong. He just had oil injected into his biceps to make them huge. For some crazy reason, he thought having fake muscles somehow made him eligible to be an MMA fighter. He gave himself the name Bazooka Hands and then stepped into the ring with another amateur fighter. However, he was forced to quit almost immediately when his famous arms exploded. His biceps literally burst before the fight could even end, kind of like two giant zits on his arm being blown up because someone squeezed them too hard. He lost the fight and had to go to the hospital. Bazooka Hands never did make a career as an MMA fighter. He actually had to undergo several surgeries to remove dead muscle and skin from his arms because of the oil he injected himself with. At one point, doctors even feared he might have to have both his arms amputated because of how much oil was in them, slowly poisoning his body. If he didn't remove the oil, it's likely he would have died. Number 4. Failed Sobriety Test In Cape Canaveral, Florida, a man was taken into custody when police pulled him over for driving under the influence. The man turned out to be Kalen Holcomb, an MMA fighter. He tried to bribe the police by offering them free martial arts lessons if they would just let him go. But the bribe wasn't good enough, and the police still took him straight to jail. The reason he was pulled over in the first place was that a sheriff's deputy in Brevard County saw him almost back his vehicle straight into the side end bar and grill building. Clearly, he was having a bit of a hard time driving. When they pulled him over, his truck stank like alcohol. He refused to take a field sobriety test and became aggressive with the police. When the cops refused his bribe of free martial arts lessons, he began to offer his services as a fighter. 
He told the cops that if they let him go, he would beat up suspects from other cases like some kind of bully for hire. The cops didn't want anything to do with it, and now he's been charged with not only a DUI, but also bribery of a public servant. Number 3. DUI Manslaughter Back in 2019, Desmond Green, the mixed martial arts fighter who fought in the UFC as a lightweight, was brought up on 20 charges, including DUI manslaughter. The UFC fighter played a pivotal role in a car crash that left two women dead. Some of his other charges included felony possession of cocaine, a whole heap of counts of DUI property damage, driving with a suspended license, and DUI causing serious bodily injury. The crash itself happened early in the morning on August 18, 2018. Desmond was driving down a Florida freeway when he veered his Dodge Durango directly into the path of an oncoming truck. The chain reaction to the impact caused three other vehicles to also crash. One of those vehicles contained Emelina Morfa and Emma Suarez Hernandez. Their vehicle swerved, hit a guardrail, and flipped all the way over. Both girls inside died, although Desmond Green only suffered minor injuries. According to what came out through the court proceedings that followed, Desmond was driving without a license, under the influence of alcohol, and stoned out of his tree. After the crash, he tried to ditch the marijuana grinder by throwing it over a concrete traffic barrier. An officer also discovered a small bag of cocaine in his truck. When they did a toxicology analysis, they found that his blood alcohol level was 0.14 and that he had been smoking a bunch of pot. Just one month after the collision that killed two people, the UFC allowed him to fight in the octagon. He then fought twice more before he was convicted of the crime and put in jail in 2020. How do you feel about this? Number 2. War Machine Roy Rage Jonathan Copenhaver legally changed his name to War Machine. He was a UFC star who is now a disgraced attempted murderer. In one of the most prolific court cases involving a fighter in recent memory, War Machine was accused of trying to murder Christy Mack after he discovered her hanging out with another man. The MMA fighter used to date Christy, who happens to be an adult film actress, but by the time he caught her with another dude, they had already been broken up. But that didn't stop him from going into an alleged roid rage and punching her face with his fists. According to what Christie accused him of, War Machine beat her up and then groped her in an extremely disturbing fashion for over two hours, while at the same time threatening to murder her. As for the other guy whom he caught Christie with, he threatened him that if he went to the police, he would kill him too. In defense, War Machine's lawyer said the fighter had brain damage caused by his fighting career. He said that War Machine used a lot of steroids, and these were the reasons for his violent outbursts. The lawyer said War Machine never tried to actually murder the girl. At the end of the trial, nobody believed the flimsy defense War Machine gave. He ended up getting 36 years to life for beating, assaulting, and threatening Christy Mann. 1. Canadian Cartel Man One of the biggest incidents of an MA fighter gone wrong has to be Stephen Skinner. The Canadian fighter was charged with murder back in 2016 and also accused of running a cocaine smuggling ring. He was arrested by the police in Venezuela after the Royal Canadian Mounted Police gave them a tip that they were searching for a murder suspect who had killed somebody back in 2011 in the Canadian province of Nova Scotia. It was later proven that Stephen Skinner shot and killed Stacey Jordan Adams in a small trailer park community outside the city of Halifax. He also tortured an elderly man for unrelated reasons. Before that, he was a fighter between 2006 and 2010 mostly just amateur stuff in Canadian fighting organizations. After his fighting and murdering, he allegedly began to work closely with the Colombian cartel to move drugs from South America and into Canada. He helped find mules by strong-arming seniors and innocent-looking moms to swallow latex capsules filled with drugs and then go from Colombia to other places in the world. Thankfully, the Venezuelan authorities arrested him and then sent him back to Canada in 2017. He pleaded guilty to manslaughter, but the drug trafficking charges could never be proven he'll get out of jail in early 2025. Who is your absolute least favorite MMA fighter? Let us know in the comments, and remember to hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, and come back soon for more awesome videos. See you next time. Bye!